Check, check. One, two, three. Awesome. All right. Well, if you have nothing off limits, well, let's I get mean, down to everything's it. Everything's <laughs> on limits. It just depends on how forthcoming you can be with <laughs> yeah. the details, I guess, is you know, the way you want to put it. Yeah. Have you, is this, uh, I always wonder if this is everyone's first podcast when they come on to Sank um, just because like, is it my volleyball. first one? Yeah. 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 Big day. <laughs> oh, this should be my fifth at this point right i mean <laughs> seriously try to make it happen well for uh I have a little the, busy schedule for the listeners and little. viewers who uh, who don't recognize the face of the voice this is scott davenport the busiest man in beach volleyball i think <laughs> it's funny because people will assume that i'm one of the busier people in beach volleyball because like today for example i commentated from 5 to 10 30 yep. and then i wrote the story on what i commentated and then I lifted, and then I came straight here. All of those are surrounding beach volleyball, but I get to like switch tasks. Right. You're just you're coaching and coaching and coaching. Twenty four straight. And then parenting. Packed. And, and then, then parenting. parenting. So it's like, yeah, I just go between the two. The <laughs> yeah. So how many athletes are you currently working with? Uh, three teams. Okay. Two women's, uh, one men's, and then I work some junior athletes, and then. Whoever calls and needs help, if I can fit it in, I'll do it. Yeah. So your current teams are Emily Stock and Megan Kraft. Yep. And Sarah Sponsel, Therese Cannon. Therese Cannon. And then now you have Troy, Troy and Field Evan. and Evan Corey. Yep. That's got to be fun. New Exciting, team. fun team. Yeah. Yeah. Good guys. Fun personalities on court. Yeah. Off court. Yeah. What do you think of their debut at the Pan Ams? Well, I mean, I wouldn't put much weight into the results because mm. we basically had two practices together. And we were kind of looking at that tournament as a practice tournament to figure out what are some of the things we need to work on communication wise, you yeah. know, system wise, kind of figure each other out, how they work together and stuff like that. So I thought they played well considering we really had no system in place. We had <laughs> right. nothing situationally figured out at all. It was just right. like, Hey, what's your set look like? <laughs> yeah. You know, and then just kind of go after, after it. each set. It was like, was that, was that good? Was that bad? Right. Okay. <laughs> like, Oh, you guys are making terrible calls. Oh, we don't work on that either. <laughs> <laughs> right. As a coach, like what's the, um, What's the first step that you take when you get a new team? It depends. Like with, it depends if it's a new new team. Yeah. Like a brand new team, or if I've worked with a player of the team. Okay. Previously, or worked with both of the players previously, and then they kind of came together. Yeah. It's like an example: Kalinsky and Stockman when they came together, they were working separately with different partners at the time before the splits happened. But I was working with both of them. Yeah. So that was more of a seamless kind of merge because they both were doing the same systems, techniques, verbiage, all that fun stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, just, you got to get them together to figure out what do you like? What do you like your sets? What kind of offense do you want to run? You know, and then defensively work on that stuff as well. But I don't know, we're used to going to four year cycles and it, there's phases to every one of the years. Yeah. Which you're super aware of, but yeah. And it, well, it's funny. I feel like COVID threw off so many things for so many reasons because now all the new partnerships had one less year to dial in yeah for this squad yeah and then last squad had an extra year right <laughs> which could be detrimental or could be beneficial it really yeah. depends yeah i think that changed a lot especially on the women's side because you look at you know sarah and melissa they were dialed yeah and then whatever reason it just like things started not falling apart but it wasn't as good as it was going in and sarah we had, we had her on the podcast. She's like, I'm pretty sure that if COVID didn't happen, I'd be an Olympic gold medalist. That's just the way things go. Yeah, most likely. They, we were definitely hitting our stride. We yeah. were in a good place. I mean, it was a an epic prize fight every time we went up against April and Alex. Oh, so, so fun. You never know. It's fun to watch, fun to be a part of. But yeah, you just never know how that's going to come out. Yeah. It could go either way. So to guarantee you'd be an Olympic gold medalist, I don't know. Yeah, it's impossible. Good chances for sure, but yeah. It's always a battle. In the Olympics, just with the like <clears throat> the pool play and the way the draws work out after pool, yeah. you never know. Because like Phil and Nick played Allison and Bruno in the quarterfinals, and everyone kind of understood that that was like the de facto gold medal match. Yep, it should have been the gold medal match. Should have been, yeah. But it could have been Mel and Sarah and April and Alex in the quarters. Just you never know the way the draws work now. Well, it was Agatha the last two uh, Olympics lost <laughs> in pool play when she wasn't probably supposed to lose. Right. Two seed gets knocked down, so yeah, it just changes kind of the dynamic of the playoffs. Yeah, gosh, I want the Olympics to go to double LM. Th- uh, will they do it though? Because like, 
the teams that don't usually get to participate in those games, they want to give them inclusion and they want right. to get matches against those teams and exposure. You still get two matches <laughs> <laughs> instead of three. It would be a shorter tournament. I wouldn't mind that. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I always wonder, man, is it like, is it good for Morocco to lose, you know, to, well, the Moroccan men, they competed okay. Right. But is, it, is it good for, like last year, Mozambique was in the world champs to lose like 21-4, 21-8? Is that... I don't think it's good for them. Yeah. I think the experience they get to have, and like uh, Sponsor was talking about it because she went to Kenya yeah. recently. Yeah. And she said just the joy that they had being at the Olympics, you know, and that perspective of saying, wow, this is so cool for you guys. And like we've worked hard to get there. Obviously, it yeah. wasn't the same path, but you're just enjoying just being here. The experience was amazing. And, you know, to short that from people, yeah, I don't think it's fair, but yeah, just to create a better competitive I mean, let's be honest, World Champs is the hardest tournament. Yeah. You know, so should we tweak that and make it open like it is currently for don't, don't keep it to four teams a, a country so it's yeah. a, a true World Championships? I don't know. Yeah. Good questions, but... I think, man, it's so hard. because <laughs> If you, you were God, what would you do? <laughs> 64 team double limb, open it up. Right. <laughs> but then that provides a host of other issues like money and... <laughs> right. <laughs> And is it feasible to do? Yeah. <laughs> so that's beach volleyball for yeah, you. Always. <laughs> but you you work with so many different personalities. Yeah. Like, I mean, you run in the full spectrum from someone like a sponsor who's one of the most competitive people I know. Now you add a Troy Field who's competitive, but also one of the goofiest people <laughs> I know. <laughs> and you have I'm everything. still getting to know him, so I can't speak to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you get every everyone in between. Yep. Do you tweak your coaching style for each kind of player because then you get sweet Therese who's a phenomenal blocker but also just like so nice <laughs> she's she's got a side to her though that yeah it's kind of like Mel rainbows and unicorns but like get her on the court and <laughs> she wants to cut you and win right <laughs> you know but I mean I, I don't tweak it necessarily I think you just get to know the athletes yeah you know and know what they need and how their personalities work and just kind of work within the confines of their personalities and the dynamic between the two which takes years to build but yeah yeah it seems like uh sarah and therese are kind of hitting it yeah um we had some bumps in the road at the beginning of the year they learned some things <laughs> <laughs> t learned some things as an athlete she didn't yeah. want to hear from us but she realized that those were the right things we had to keep doing these things and sarah went to africa and we had made a joke we're like i think we have to make an annual trip now <laughs> <laughs> like you go to africa you come back you're just like a different person yeah. you know but no i think she gained some massive perspective life perspective from that and it was really good to see you know her as a person just be like wow this is it doesn't have to be all about volleyball there's right. more to life yeah you know so i think that gave her a different perspective on sports you know and they came back and we came together and yeah they're playing pretty consistent and i think that's all you need to do is play consistent and get a couple pops here and there that are really good yeah i think Therese is one of the few people i've seen who could win the most improved player like three years in a row <laughs> <laughs> don't tell her that <laughs> yeah. yeah she keeps getting better at things i mean she's got a massive ceiling obviously and you know she came in pretty raw to the sport yeah you know didn't have a lot of years at, at usc but you know she's she's done a lot of work put a lot of work in her story's pretty cool <clears throat> just upstate new york my hometown too you're upstate New York too. You're a Rochester yeah. guy. That's, I didn't that's know that. That's why I picked to work with her. I wasn't. It wasn't an accident. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah. Wait, how long did you grow up there for? I was there for 22 years. Wow. Yeah. Where'd you go to college? I went to IPFW, played there for a year, and then bounced back. For Mastodon. Electric. Yeah. For, Great mascot. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was a fun place to play it too. It was like always a packed house. Yeah. Um, bounced back to New York for a year. My dad passed away. Then I moved out here and just gave it a go. Wow. Yep. What made you want to come out here? It was weird. There was a place called Hot Shots in Rochester that was okay. an indoor beach volleyball facility okay. where we all went and played. And it was Mike Dodd, Adam Johnson, I think Mike Whitmarsh came out, and they did like an exhibition. We got to play against them yeah. you know, for a match. And I asked Mike, I was like, hey, I know this is like super random, but like, do you think I would have a chance if I came out and gave it a go? And he's like, maybe. And he's like, you got a lot of work to do, obviously, yeah. but you can't do it here. Right. He's like, so if you want to give it a shot, you got to move out there. And so, yeah, I just, I said, why not? No give kidding. Yeah. I didn't know that. It, could, it couldn't be worse. It couldn't be worse than where I was. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, nine months of winter, uh, you, know. <laughs> you know, you're from the East coast. It's like, yeah. Yeah. So Man, took so the you, shot and it just kind of worked out. So you were 22 
when you popped out? Of I was about 24 when I finally okay. came out. Yeah, so it was 96. That's a big move. It was. A buddy of mine came out with me, so that was kind of cool. Yeah. And so we had, you know, that working, and we were down in San Clemente for probably like four or five years. Okay. And then the playing, pe- the people down there, the groups just kind of like dissipated. There wasn't a lot of guys. To, yeah. Guys down there. But luckily, I got to go out with Karch and Adam and Kent and those guys. Who? Yeah. I learned a lot. <laughs> Dude, I learned so much. It was like the best place to be. And Todd Amati, one of the guys that was a qualifier guy back in the day, he's like, you got to move there. He's like, you can go to LA. He's like, but if you come down here and you're fortunate enough to work your way onto the courts with those guys. Yeah. So you're going to learn so much. Because they were all Laguna guys, right? Or was that? Uh, Capistrano. Okay. San Clemente. Uh, yeah. Adam was Laguna, but he would come down when he partnered with Karch. And, you know, obviously where Karch is training, people are going there. Right. <laughs> so he wasn't traveling to LA. He, he, he was his own magnetic force. Yeah. He's like, hey, you want to practice? Come come to my courts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That had to have been a hard move to make because just in my experience growing up in a small town, making a move to somewhere like California. It's like California. It was big. <laughs> it's a big yeah. thing. It's a big move. Yeah. But I mean, you got to take a shot at something, right? Yeah. It's your dream. You're going to go for it and see what works out. How did, uh, how did you make the move? Did you just, cause like Ryan Darty knew nothing. So he just came <laughs> out with, yeah, I think he had five grand in his bank account. Yep. Stopped in Vegas, blew 2,500 at Jesus. the craps tables. <laughs> and then he popped down and got a job as like uh, he was a pizza delivery boy. Right. And to, and he made that work until he won him and Casey won an NVL. Yep. They beat Phil and Todd, and he's like, "All right, I'm, I'm done delivering pizzas." I'm done delivering pizza. <laughs> Good for him. But everyone does it so different. Some people just leave like no safety net, nothing. Some people have a job lined up. Yeah, I had some money in the bank, which helped. Um, but I also had a line on a job <clears throat> as a personal trainer. I came okay. in contact with somebody in Florida who was down in Florida for about three months before I came out. Met this guy, he was an inventor, he came up with this exercise technology and he sold some out here in California, one person in Newport, one up in uh, in Hollywood area. And he's like, hey, I need someone to train these people because it's com- it's complicated and they don't know how to use it. So it was instant income. And I was, so that kind of helped a lot yeah. too. Yeah, that helps a lot when you have that. Helps a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and you came out, so you came out in 96, you said? 96, yeah. Tough time to come out for beach volleyball. Yeah. Because that was both the, the height and then the precipitous fall. <laughs> yeah, it's a running joke when people ask me. I was like, if I had, I, I calculated the finishes that I had my very first year <laughs> in, nine, I think it was 97 or 98, first full-time year. And based on the previous non-bankruptcy year, I yeah. was like, I would have made like 80 grand. <laughs> oh, no. Instead, I made like 10. <laughs> oh, man. And 10 grand today. If you're making 10 grand yeah. in prize money today, I mean, you're rolling. Oh, no, it's for the year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not for you. Yeah. You know, but yeah. It was it was a rough time. Yeah, yeah. How uh, how long did you end up sticking with it? Because that's there's like two of those phases, right? There's the end of the '90s where you had that bankruptcy, and then you had the end of the, like the 2010 era, yeah. where there's very few holdovers from the guys who were playing very well in 08, 09, and then 2010 hit, and then you had the holdovers, few who made it to, through 2013. How did you kind of bridge that gap? I mean, I was working the whole time. Yeah, I mean, I was never a full time player. Yeah unfortunately, but not everybody can really. <laughs> right. I mean, very few. Yeah, How many players would you estimate can, like, can do it full time? Yeah. Usually they can earn their way to be full time, but at the start to start full time, you've got to have support. Like you got to have family. Yeah. You know, they're helping you out or whatever, or just independently wealthy. Yeah. You know, but it's, it's a low percentage, I think. Yeah. Now it's different, obviously with the USA funding. Yeah. It helps you a know, lot. It helps a lot of people out so they can dedicate more time to it, which is great. But Back then, I don't know, like top 1%. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who had sponsors that were making money. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's now it's tough. Do you travel with your teams a lot? I do. More than I'd like, but <laughs> 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 no. Uh, it's, you know, I've been doing it since, what, 2009 or 10. So it's, okay. it's a lot. It's a yeah. lot of travel for that many years. And then two kids at home, it's tough. But I go as much as I can. Yeah. You know, as much as I can get them looked after and... And then you got, uh, is Chris on the road right now? Chris is. He's in Latvia right now with okay. Emily and Meg. And that's yep. Chris Flood for the listeners who don't know. Uh, any, any pro <laughs> players who need a coach, Chris is looking for a dedicated team. Yeah. He does fantastic work with us, but he wants to spread his wings. So He's had a lot of high-level experience. Dude, he's been, he worked with me, God, it's been like six, seven years. How did you guys get together? Do you know Gary Barnes, the name? Yes. Yeah. So Gary, longtime friend player. Yeah. He was doing some lessons with me, and he brought Chris out. He was new to the area. He yeah. just came out to do practices with me, and 
we were doing stuff and he kind of liked what we were saying. And then he's, I was like, dude, if you want to help anytime, come help, learn while we're talking, you know, learn as much as you can. He started coming, started helping. Uh, he had experience doing that in Kentucky too, in Louisville, uh, University of Louisville as a, just an arm at practice. Okay. Um, so yeah, he just started learning the game and then he's, he was trying to play at the same time. And he's like, what do you think? I was like, you can make more money coaching <laughs> and be around everything you want to be around and not beat yourself up physically. Yeah. And you can still play part time if you want and then go out there and you know right. make your main draw or whatever your goal is. I'm like, or you can go beat yourself up and then eventually you're going to do this anyways, <laughs> <laughs> you know, cause you got the brain for it. You got the eye for it. Right. So he just started doing it more full time and. I was really good at it. Yeah. And he, uh, it's funny whenever I'm commentating, they'll always pan over and do little shots of the crowd. I'm like, ah, oh, there he is. I knew he'd be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he's good. He's been super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And Emily and Meg are having a pretty good run in Latvia right now. Yeah. They're doing all right. I lost a heartbreaker to China, but. But that might, it's so weird. The second match of modified pool in a 24 team draw is so strange because if you win your first, it's, it's just for seeding. Sometimes if you win, you kind of screw yourself. Some, well, it's, yeah, it's, you never know, right? Yeah. It's a draw. Because that's what, in Virginia Beach, me and JD, we lost to Sean Cook and Jake Dietrich in our second. Mm -hmm. And that was the best thing we could have done. Oh, was it pool play there too? Yeah. So Did the, they tour, the, the tour series was switched to okay. the same as challenges. Okay. And so Jake and Sean end up getting a way tougher draw, <laughs> both in the first and second round. And then me and JD, we still had to win two tough matches, yep. but it wasn't. We would have played Hagen and Logan in the quarters instead of the semis. I was like, because all you need to do to qualify for Hermosa was make the semis. And yep. I was like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, the draw stuff is just so random. Yeah. You know, I don't, I haven't been a big fan of it. I mean, I've been on the good side of it, but a lot of my teams have been on the really bad side of it. Yeah. I don't know. I think you should just keep your seeds. Like Then it's more valuable. Like you're right. playing for more every match. Right. You know, but Theo always made the running joke. Ah, don't even play the game. It doesn't matter. Well, Save your energy. Did you see their match today? No. <laughs> I did he not play or just show up and not play? <laughs> well, they sh they were they, they were, were there. They were on the court <laughs> physically. The, the ghosts of Theo and Trevor were on the court. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so it was, they won their first, beat uh, Australia pretty good, and then yep. they're playing Vandeveld and Immers, and Theo starts out serving sky balls first ball, and I was oh like, God. "Oh boy, we're in for it, ladies Jesus. and gentlemen!" And yeah. then they just sort of walked around and right. So and conserving energy. Yeah. It was an active forfeit. Gotcha. <laughs> That's how I would describe that. I think at that point, you might as well just forfeit. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know, maybe there, I don't know if there's a policy with forfeiting, if you need to show like injury or you get fined or whatever, yeah, but. I forget what it is. I think you might only get one like freebie and then it has to be an injury. Okay. Yeah. Something it was like a, that. It was a funny change to commentate. Oh, you commentated. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Did he play defense split block the whole time? They split. Too? Perfect. Yeah. Split the whole time. Got his dream. Sky ball. To, oh yeah. <laughs> if you were six, five, <laughs> <laughs> he can play defense at six, eight. He can do it. I mean, if you hit it at him, like he had a couple balls that were hit at him and he got him up yeah. and it was funny. Cause like they were just joking the whole match and the mics, are on the oh, court yeah. are pretty good and they're you could good. hear him and Trevor laughing and Theo is like more digs than you Trevor <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny. he takes pride in his defense he, he does <laughs> <laughs> so you made the transition from player to coach around like that 09 10 I had been I mean I've been coaching club indoor forever okay um, and then I was coaching at a division two school uh, over here at Dominguez I did that for quite some time as well um, and I was doing it while I was kind of tail ending playing okay. And then I continued to do it full time uh, after I kind of stopped. I think it was like oh seven or oh eight or something like that. And then a buddy was like, "Hey, you need any coaching on the beach?" And I'm like, "I could, I guess." Yeah. Came out, started helping him, and Brooke Niles was like, "Are you coaching? Hey, can you help us?" And I was like, <laughs> uh, "Okay." And then she's like, "You got to work with Nick." And I was like, "Okay." <laughs> and I just kind of snowballed from there and just picked yeah. up teams. And yeah. was it was it hard to? make the switch from playing to coaching obviously you had been coaching the whole time but to stop playing i feel like I, I think that's why it was easier for me because i was coaching the whole time okay you know and when i stopped playing and was still coaching it was easier to step back the emotional attachment to what was going on mm -hmm. you know because you you know you didn't have any control as a coach you're like i i can only impact the game so much indoors right. especially you a little bit more um, but the beach you're like i don't know i can't do anything i just prepare you guys and right. hopefully you get it done um but even indoor, it became 
easier to detach yourself emotionally because you're just like you can't control it you can just help and then just see what happens right you know but i think if i had been a like april's doing it now i don't know how, if you've talked to her about it or not mm -hmm. but i don't know how she's transitioning you know because it was like immediately you're done with playing and now you're coaching yeah it's well like, april can't sit still and she's got to be doing something productive <laughs> right you know? I mean, she's growing a baby and she's like i'm gonna coach you and i'm gonna coach you yeah and do this and do that and she's down in chula vista right now right. coaching some usa thing <laughs> good for her <laughs> that's yeah. a lot but she she was funny talking to her about coaching because she she said that she wasn't stressed at all like coaching betsy and julia mm. in huntington but after she was like it felt like i'd played a whole tournament mm. she's like just the wear and tear on the body was still hard <laughs> yeah because it's different like yeah coaching like you don't warm up you don't stretch out right but you go get a bunch of reps yeah and then you sit and you and get tight <laughs> exactly and then she said she wasn't stressed, but for me, if I if I'm just watching Delaney, or even like a, on a smaller scale, try like I get stressed. I'm like, yeah. well, why'd you do that? <laughs> I can't imagine. Like you, you mentioned that having less control on the beach because you can't be in the box you know, on internationally, but that would stress me out having zero control over it. I'm just like, yeah, why? <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah, we have. I have a good sports psychologist I've been working with okay. for a long time, so he has helped put things into perspective years ago. Yeah. But I'm a big statistical guy too. Yeah, you know, big data driven and kind of how we do things. So, to me, it's about the numbers, and you know, it's easy, unforced. Data. Like that match they had against China, Emily and Meg. Tons of opportunities to score points, hitting balls out of bounds by like fractions of inches. Yeah, it's like that's a fifty-fifty coin flip. Like every time you, we have this perceived value or perceived probability that we think we control things. Right. You know, this is our sports sports like guys. You know, kind of way of framing it. He's like, you don't. Like, once the ball hits your arms, hits your hands, he's like, flip a coin. You don't know. Right. He's like, you think you might be controlling where you want it to go, and for the most part, you can, but yeah. it's still a 50 50. So, yeah. If you kind of approach it that way, it's not so bad. Yeah. Where did you, have you always been kind of more analytically driven? Because I think you and Jordan Chang is also really big into the stats, which is sort of a rare thing in beach volleyball, mm -hmm. which is sort of, as far as sports statistics go, is a wasteland there's very little information you gotta yeah. dig it up yourself and make it all on your own for the yeah. most part well i'm coming from the era too where we had to remember it all okay or write it down yeah like we didn't have video it's too expensive to buy <laughs> right. a camera and stuff too cumbersome so we had to remember it you know and then it just became either guys played by feel or you played by you know your memory and, and, and making adjustments in real time knowing what historically a guy would do against you or somebody else mm -hmm. so i mean to me it just there's always the eye test yeah you know an experienced eye can tell you yeah this is what's gonna happen this is what they're doing but the data supports that yeah and the data can also drive you to different patterns and different strategies within the patterns so it's it's always made more sense to me to like use it yeah and not rely on it but like use it do you ever uh do you ever chat with jeff alzina I haven't in a long, long time because <laughs> z is a big video and stats guy <clears throat> yeah i remember when we had him on years ago it was probably during covid um he was talking about when he took over the greece program yep um that it was he had vhs videos and wow. he just poured through vhs tapes and vhs tapes he's like i was watching 40 hours of vhs a Jeez. week <laughs> that's hard <laughs> that's like the old click fast forward pause yeah and now we have volumetrics <laughs> and it's just like go go yeah, go cut go. it up it's so easy yeah hey brian cut it up for me <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> now it's easy i bet when you got your hands on easier video i mean you, that was probably like a candy store it's funny. I was just talking to Brian about this because we're doing a, we're kind of doing a comparative analysis between Huddle and, and this new program, Beach Data. It's not super new, but we've been using it. It's a Czech company. Um, and I, I think it's amazing. It's got an app for iPad. It's also got the desktop. Nice. Um, but in doing the comparison, like I've been around this sport since there was like no iteration of technology. And then yeah. all of a sudden it was like, it was, what was it? Uh, not Volumetrics. Data Volley? The data Volley. Yeah. We were using that and we couldn't, I couldn't pull information out and present it the way I wanted to because yeah. you just couldn't, the way they coded it, it was indoor. So I've been through like every iteration of it <laughs> yeah. and it's gotten way better, which is great. But like we don't, with our huddle, we don't use the statistical aspect of it yeah. for some reason. We're not, we don't have that ability that indoor does, we don't. So we have to create our own um, apps to pull the files in, put the files into and pull the information out. Yeah. So it's kind of cumbersome, um, but yeah, I mean, I probably didn't answer your question <laughs> off on a tangent, but 
Um, I think it's extremely important, and I think more people need to use it in the beach for sure. Yeah, because it's like you get a player like like Try, who is notorious for just sort of shutting his brain off, and he's just like, oh, I never know the score, I never know the tendencies. I just he's he just present. That's feels good. It. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and is that would you say that's better to have in a match or to be like thinking? constantly be having that sort of background running um melissa was a great example of a field player instinctual mm -hmm. off the charts and then when we we brought the data you know and added it to what she was really good at doing it had simplified things even more yeah you know because again and sarah's husband adam wrote a program for us and mm. it was off the charts best thing helped so much yeah but the percentage of the things that we saw happen it was like Mel, we're going to put you here, and you don't have to worry about these things. Just look look for two things, and then look for the tendencies that give you those two things. Yeah. She's like, what do you mean? It's like, the data doesn't support you should care about these other things <laughs> enough <laughs> yeah. to look for them. And if they happen, let them happen. If they happen more than 30% of the time or three out of 10 times, then we, we can adjust out of our game plans. Mm -hmm. She was like, oh, that makes it so much easier. I'm like, yeah, that's... That's what the data is good for. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then she would make plays on top of that because she was just so instinctual and re read the game so well. But I think there's a good, it enhances, I think, if, I like you, if you use it the right way. I don't yeah. think you need to, like, again, rely on it, no. And, you know, Spots was super instinctual as well. Yeah. You know, and then we're bringing more data to her and she's like, sometimes it's too much. And she's like, yeah, it's too much. I'm like, All right, cool, back it down. Yeah. I'll just give you a couple things here and there. It's fine. But it's, I think it's helped her see the game better. Yeah. You know? which she saw already incredibly, you know, but if you can steal a point or two, we all know that's the difference. Yeah. So. I'm sure, I mean, just the, the names that you've worked with, I mean, you've worked with some of the best players in the world for a pretty long time. Yeah, I got a long list. <laughs> you've, I mean, you've I'm probably, pretty fortunate. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. Well, I mean, you make your own luck in this sport. I mean, <laughs> it's, if you were a bad coach, you're not going to be coaching Melissa <laughs> and Pavin and all like, yeah. and the sponsors of the world. I'm sure you've probably learned a lot as a coach over the years having worked with like so many of the greats because it, yep. it's i think it's just such a good relationship between player and coach where the players are supposed to be the ones learning a ton from coaches but i'm sure that you've learned a ton oh, over yeah. the years working with the best in the world mm -hmm. i learned that i didn't know what i thought i knew about a lot of players when i started working with them yeah you know there's players that you know we work heavily on vision for offense <clears throat> and based on how you know i'm not gonna name names but one particular player was running their offense and, and moving things around, I assumed that that player saw everything on the court, like had <laughs> complete vision. And when I started working with the person, they're like, no, I just see the block and kind of get the block to do what I want it to do. I'm like, how? How is it not possible you don't see past? Because the dude jumped over here and you had to see that. He's like, I don't see it. It's like, yeah. holy shit. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you learn, you learn to not think you know very much. <laughs> yeah. You know, and just to I keep, I mean, I learned so much from everybody. You know, there's different perspectives. Theo's a great example. Pavin's a great example. They saw the game at such a high level. Yeah. Remembered everything, anticipated it happening before it happened based on the data that you'd studied beforehand. Yeah. You know, I mean, they she, she would make micro adjustments in games and just like, why'd you do that? Well, because six times ago she did this and the last time we played her, I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, that's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But, I mean, you learn a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And working with all these world-class athletes, too, uh, they're world-class because they're extremely good and extremely, in, in some senses, like hard-headed in, in a good way. I feel like that's the best, the best competitors in the world. They do what they do because they believe it's right. And sometimes, like Stein talks about that with UCLA girls. Like, I recruit girls who want to push back yeah. against what I say, and then we kind of meet in the middle and you've worked with some of the best in the world. I'm sure that the emotional management of working with athletes it has its own give and take as well, where it's like you have your ideas and they have theirs. How do you meet in the middle a lot of times? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, you got to know the people. You yeah. get to know them as people and then know what you can push and what you can't push. Um, I don't view coaching as coaching. I view it as teaching. You know? I mean, to me, it's a learning environment. You're trying to develop athletes to best, to best your ability to do that. So... I mean, I always make the running joke is I don't walk into a math class or a science class at university and the teacher's yelling at me or telling me to do this, do this, do this. It's like there's an interaction, there's a collaboration, you're learning, yeah. right? Hopefully they're going to exchange ideas and together you're going to, you know, get better at everything. So, I mean, to me, that's what's more important. 
you know. And you just you exchange ideas. You get to know the people and what works with them. And you can be flexible within your system and create systems that work for them. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as you keep the fundamentals the same. Yeah. And explain intelligently to them what you think. And if they agree, they're like, oh, at least it makes sense. You know, you had a reason why you're doing something. You didn't just do it because somebody told you before. Right. This is how you learned it. Right. It's like you figured it out on top of that. So I think that's been the biggest piece is just collaborating with them mm -hmm. and then trying to teach what I know, which, you know, I learned too. So, you know, it kind of works hand in hand. Yeah. yeah. And I think your track record speaks for itself because I can't think of a single team you've worked with that hasn't turned out to be pretty exceptional. It's a big word. You're a good hype man. I need to bring you along. <laughs> That's uh, what we're here for. <laughs> I would think, I would frame it differently. I would say that I think all the teams that I've worked with have developed and improved over the course of you know yeah. our time together. Um, and that's the end game, right? If they're getting better and continue to do, get better at something, then we're doing our jobs. Yeah. And I think uh, I mentioned that Therese, you know, she could win most improved three years in a row. But I think last year, one of the biggest improvements I noticed was in Sponsor, uh, especially on the offensive end. And I know that you, oh, have, you saw that good. <laughs> <laughs> it we worked hard at that. <laughs> she was a totally different player. And she was obviously an incredible volleyball player before i mean her and kelly were the youngest yeah. team in u.s history to go to the olympics and she was defender of the year and all that but i mean she leveled up and so when you see a player like that is it it takes like some courage to say you know what here's where you are i think you can be way better here's where we can make some changes because a lot of times if you make a change to an approach or an arm swing or whatever it may be there's a little get worse before you get better sometimes yeah most of the time yeah is that how do you navigate that as a coach or approach that because for me that would be my biggest uh i'd be hesitant to do that be like, you're amazing i think you can be better <laughs> you're going to be worse for a little i promise it'll work <laughs> yeah um i mean we do a lot of progression training yeah you know, i'm heavy technical guy so biomechanics based movement based and stuff like that so you know when you explain to them this is why we're doing it your body functions like this it'll be better for you blah blah, blah. you know they they kind of buy in a little bit and then they start doing this stuff and understanding I can control my body. Mm -hmm. I can't really control the results, you know, but the more I control this, the more I control that. Um, they buy in and they start trying it more freely. Yeah. Um, in the case of like sponsor, there's different level athletes. As we all know, they're tiered off, right? Tier one, tier two, tier three. And even with inside of like tier one, tier two, tier three, I still think inside of tier one, there's elite athletes with proprioceptive nature. Yeah. You know, I mean, their ability to control their bodies like that because you tell them to do some. There's probably been like three or four out of all the athletes I've worked with that have that ability. Mm -hmm. um, Nicole Brana comes to mind. She was one. I was just like, hey, I want you to do this with your arm to make the ball do. She's like, okay. Immediately did it. And I was like, <laughs> wow, that's really cool. Can you do it again? It was like repetitive, repetitive, repetitive. I was yeah. like, okay, this is going to be fun. You know, so, but. The, there's not a lot of them that can do that. It takes yeah. work. And know. that's that's like, when when do you try to make those changes? Because I feel like in-season changes are so difficult to make. No. Pre-season. Yeah. Pre-season. Pre-season, off-season. Yeah, yeah, totally. You spend time doing it. and You got to build in. To me, you got to build into it. I mean, you can acquire the skill, then you can apply the skill, and then you can practice the skill in live, live okay. environments. You know, and it's it's that progression, I think, that we, we always go with in our system. Mm -hmm. And we talked to them about it. We're like, hey, you're going to learn it, you're going to apply it, and then you're going to put it to use, and we're going to have you focus on the process. We're not going to yeah. care about if you're scoring or you're winning this drill or any of that stuff. Um, and you're going to fail, and it's okay because it's practice. Yeah. But if you're getting better at whatever one or two skills we decided that we were going to work on technically today, mm -hmm. then you won practice. And everybody else who was at practice didn't, even though they may have won the score or right. won the games. They might think they won practice, but you're walking away going... I got 20% better, 30% better at this thing I was trying to get better at today. Exactly. You know, and inside the context of that, we might be restricting our athletes from doing certain things. Yeah. And the other team might not even know we're doing it, you know, but yeah. they're still trying to beat you. And you're like, hey, I'm just going angle. That's all I'm doing. Yep. I love that. <laughs> working on this technique. That's all <clears throat> yeah. I care about. And then <laughs> if you're over it. there, I got to do something different, but I'm still working on this technique. <laughs> yeah. There's just so many different ways to win at practice. Yeah. And if, if you lose every set, but if you worked on your little angle dart that you're working on with whatever new arm swing, then yep. you won practice. You won. 
And it's April talked about that. I think the first time we ever had her on a podcast, she was talking about how she'll go through practices where all she's doing is working on different kinds of line attacks. Yep. And she's like, they could see it and know what I'm doing and they could dig me a hundred times. And I think that I had a better practice than they did. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. No, they just did that. We actually practiced against Bet Betsy and uh, Julia. Yeah. Last week, and it was funny because they were working on po they were working on uh, shots and pokes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could tell, and we were doing a competitive drill, and I was like, "Are you guys gonna change what you're doing?" And they're like, I'm like, "That's what they're working on. Like, they're not trying to beat you. They're trying to work on something. Right. Like, fix it so that you're gonna score on them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and then we're working on our stuff. They're like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, it's April. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> right. That's why I love it when guys be like, oh, yeah, we had a great practice. Like, we beat, on, we beat up on these guys. I'm like, wonder what the restrictions were. <laughs> yeah. It depends on the team, right? Right. Yeah. Like, a lot of players don't approach it that way. Coaches don't approach it that way. Yeah. And I think that's the big – that's a massive difference, I think, in the evolution of coaching in the beach versus indoor. Indoor is already at the highest level. Right. They've been doing all this stuff forever. Mm -hmm. You know, data-driven – all that stuff, biomechanics driven, and they're teaching everything pretty consistently. Right. But they're they're thinking about that stuff. You know, mm -hmm. the contents of six on six was way more complex. Yeah. You know, I think we need that education to trickle down into the beach. Yeah. You know, more coaches need to apply that stuff. You know. Well, where, I mean, you you developed your coaching acumen throughout the years and years, but where did where would you say that you kind of refined your beach coaching style i guess because there's no as you mentioned there's no real education system for beach coaching no. just kind of trial and error and build it up as you go i don't think there's a, a massive leap <clears throat> technique wise between the two mm -hmm. i think there's nuances to it yeah um but again i also think that a lot of beach coaches don't teach technical aspects of the game technical movements and biomechanical things it's yeah. more just take people through drills get them doing a bunch of stuff give them some cues about results-based things like, oh, it needs to go a little higher, it needs to go a little wider, whatever, stuff like that. And the athletes are athletes and they figure it out, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, because to me, the the biggest indicator of that is tendencies. Yeah. You know, like we're watching video, we're looking at stuff, we're like, oh, they dropped their elbow here, they did this, that happens, blah, blah. If you don't create ways to fix those tendencies, like, are you improving? No, the idea behind like, why was Missy so good? Why was Karch so good offensively? I mean, I, I got to practice against him for five years, so I figured it out. Like, that's why he's that good. And then we coached against Missy for years, and it was like, you can't tell anything different. Like, they're not showing you anything. And mm -hmm. that's that's the illusion, right? That's There's no tendencies. Yeah. You know, so that's fundamentally where I kind of premise what I do. I was like, I got to teach everybody to look the same every time you're doing something, if you can. Yeah. You know, and then if I don't give you anything until it's like fractions of seconds before I actually do something, I get a little bit of advantage. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I don't think that happens enough across the world, you know, because obviously I've been coaching against a lot of teams that are the same and they're not doing anything different. Yeah. You know, they do what they do well, which is why they're that good. Right. But they're still doing the same things, you know. I think that's the, the hallmark of an elite offensive player is that their approach for their line shot until the very last half second before hand hits ball yep. it looks the exact same as an angle swing yep. and a lot of guys i'll be like that's what i love about commentating too is that i just get to watch mm -hmm. I, just, I get paid to watch volleyball right and, I'm, <laughs> and so i'm just like analyzing because all you, like as a commentator all you're doing is trying to figure out the chess match of the game as it's going on mm -hmm. i think it's so fun watching that and this is what he does oh his elbow's dropping here usually means this is happening exactly. just tendencies right and it's, I have a blast figuring that stuff out. I'm sure you probably have. Well, that's a lot why of fun I continue to coach. Yeah. Yeah. The game within the game is the only fun part about it. But yeah. Maybe that's why it's easy to detach emotionally, too, because you're like, yeah. We're playing a chess match. You know, are they making the right moves? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You're the first person I've met who, uh, as a, well, first coach I've met who's talked about using a sports psychologist as a coach. Usually players, I've only heard that in the context of a player using it. Yeah. Well, uh, Lee Hancock's our guy. He's okay. been, I've been with him since I was at Dominguez. He helped with a, one of my junior clubs that kind of got him in introduced into the game mm -hmm. and then he helped with the college and then he started helping with my teams on the beach. Um, and he was a soccer guy, you know, MLS college, stuff like that. So he had that background. He didn't know anything about what he was getting himself into. Um, but he learned a lot and it, it, the way he does things, I don't know. It's, it might be different. I don't know any different. You know, I've only worked with him. Yeah. Um, so his background is teaching. Okay. You know, he's, He's a professor over at Dominguez, and he runs the PE program over there. So 
he approaches the sports psych the same way. Like he teaches the athletes what they need to learn about awareness, about, you know, all these different things. And then he applies it, you know, and then we try to put measures in place at practice to enforce it and reinforce it. You know, and he's helped me tremendously because learning what I've learned from him about sports psych allows me to reinforce the things that he's trying to get them to do mm -hmm. on the daily at practice over and over again, just by how I frame my, my, uh, conversations, yeah. the things that I say to them, very, very particular about how I words. I don't say a lot, but when I say something, I make sure that it's trying to frame their thoughts in line with what he's working with them on. Okay. You know, but like, it's not just him meeting with them. Like I'll meet with him. We'll meet as a group. You know, it's, it's very collaborative, you know, and it's, I think that's the way all sports psych should work with teams and they probably do in other, you know, um, sports but yeah i haven't encountered that yet but then again i haven't really worked with anybody yeah you know i know usa supplies it and it's just there's so many people that they work with i just don't think they have the time to do something like that yeah it's very involved and he's at their disposal they can text him call him whenever on the road wherever and it's just like you know it's a lifeline it's good yeah are you uh are you a reader no i'm not Okay. Uh, yeah. You struggle. I don't have time. I don't have time, but yeah. <laughs> I used Jeez. to. <laughs> I mean, between the amount of teams you coach and then you got your, your two kids, yeah, you're probably stretched yeah. pretty thin. And then I'm yeah. sure you're watching a ton of film as well. Yeah. <laughs> like all, all manner of things. <laughs> yeah. I got time to read probably on the planes, but I don't, I'd rather sleep. <laughs> yeah. Or, I mean, it's those plane rides, man. Since I've like mostly stopped playing international, but oh my gosh, like flying back from Doha, a 17 hour flight. Yeah. You watch like three movies, read like fifty pages of a book, and you look, and you got ten hours left. I'm like, did you go to the I'm Maldives? Never getting off this plane? No, I didn't do the Maldives. Yeah, that was a fun fifty hour trip. No, planes, trains, and automobiles. It was ridiculous. <sighs> what was? Did you go east or west to get there? Uh, I think I went. God, I don't, I don't even know. know what the itinerary would be. To get it was gnarly. I mean, I had to get my miles. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I had to keep my status, so that trip was gonna get it, no problem. So I had to like yeah. manipulate a little bit. Yeah, but yeah, it was some brutal layovers, and yeah, it was it was rough. <laughs> yeah, well, of all tournaments to go to, I mean, that looked like a pretty good one. It, yeah, the last couple of days were great. Yeah, yeah, the first <laughs> the first part of the week was just dumping rain and winds, and then it would just go sideways, and it was like, what? What are we doing here? But that was the tail end of their winter. Yeah, you know, and then the last couple of days was like, oh, hey. It's vacation weather now. Yeah. It yeah. was bonkers commentating that one because you could see when they would do a drone shot, mm -hmm. you could see it was just this beautiful postcard day. But in the distance, there was just this black <laughs> hole coming. And then it would just like, whoo, boom, and then 10 minutes later, it was a postcard day again. I was yeah. like, this is wild. The cool thing was you could see it coming. Yeah. So it wasn't a surprise. Like, yeah, I've got about 15 minutes and then we got to run into the tents. <laughs> yeah. But when it came in too, it literally came in sideways. Yeah. I just remember holding, we were sitting on the beach, holding the umbrellas behind us, not above us, behind us, because it yeah. was coming and just crushing it. And then once the rain turns off, then the the temperature goes oh, up yeah. about 200 degrees yeah. and everyone's hair is just, like, humidity is <laughs> 800%. Gnarly. <laughs> <laughs> it was gnarly. <laughs> yeah. Have you traveled this year? I have. I've gone to, where'd I go? Doha. Doha's a tough one. It is. Uh, I just got back from Czech Republic. That was a rough week as well, just... <clears throat> the air conditioning wasn't working in the room, so the sleep you're supposed to get didn't happen. Yeah. And that turns into three days of no sleep. That's, so, that's a tough one. Yeah. July's going to be a tough month. I'm gone all, all, all month in July. But pretty good tournament, though. Yeah, it worked out to be really well. The girls were <laughs> jet-lagged pretty bad on the qualifier day, too, and they got through it. <laughs> and then they just they felt better, and it worked they out They balled well. out in the quali. I mean, they got in and out of both matches, like an yeah. hour total. Yeah, they did well. They played good. And then, man, they played awesome. In the main draw. Consistent. That's We kept preaching the theme. Just That's the key. Serve good, play consistent, and you got a chance. Yeah. You know, it's the teams that are winning right now. Those, uh, those elite 16s, I mean, you could, as we saw, I mean, two teams from the qualifier ended up on the podium. Yep. I mean. Three. Anything could happen. Guys, too. Miles. Yeah, if you include the guys. Yeah, yeah and then you have Duda and Anna Patricia. Duda's just, she's awesome. Yeah. I love watching Duda. She's that team should be in the finals every week. <laughs> yeah. That's what I told Lucas while they're doing this ceremony. I'm like, you guys are supposed to be there like every week. Like, yeah. what's up? <laughs> like, don't take time off. Just go dominate. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, you think you see Duda, you're like, you should be about 33 years old, given how much you've accomplished. Yes. It still blows my mind that she was voted the best player in the world when she was 18. Mm -hmm. 
That's crazy. It's phenomenal. She's like the LeBron of beach volleyball. Yeah. <laughs> Sweetheart, too. She's great. Yeah, one of the nicest yeah. people. Uh, like, it's so cool when you meet someone that good and they turn out to be one of the sweetest people in the world. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> like, AP is, is, too. It's funny because, like, her on-court demeanor, you wouldn't think. Right. You know, but when you're not competing against her, she's, like, just a big kid having fun. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what Kelly Chang said that because were you watching their – was it the finals in Tepic? Or semis? I think it was finals. The finals no, when semis. Yeah, you're right. when AP hit one off Kelly's hands and they called no touch. Oh. <laughs> and so Kelly immediately just turns back and starts walking. And yeah. Trish has got those wide, the eyes yeah. this big. And she was. And after uh, Kelly and Sarah won, AP like immediately goes up to her. And then we ended up getting lunch with Kelly and Jordan later after they got back. And she's like, yeah. And then afterwards, we were just like playing cards. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, she's the nicest person. Yeah, we battled them in Vegas in 2018, I think it was. Was it semis? Yeah, in the semis. And there were some stare downs going on. Yeah. There were some massive blocks, some yeah. Yahtzee balls, you know, between the two blockers that were going at it a little bit. And then we went to watch the next semi because obviously we're playing losers and winners. And they were sitting behind us. And we just started, like, talking smack. <laughs> I was like... <laughs> This was like our first experience against her. Yeah. I was like, oh, this is cool. This will be fun. <laughs> and she was playing with Rebecca then? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That was back in 18, yeah, that quad. And that you were with Pavin and Mel? Mel. Mm -hmm. Who were your – did you have a guys team back then? Or were you just – No, that's a long story. Okay. <laughs> we, won't, we won't talk about the USA policies that <laughs> – Oh, man. Are controversial right. to some of us coaches. <laughs> yeah. I don't even. I I always forget that because it's weird because like so many foreign teams live here, right? And train here and yeah. And then if you work and use coaches from here, right, right. And then we have the whole USA staff is Brazilian. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. It's uh. <laughs> it's tough to be a coach just because I was actually thinking about it on my way over here that this is one of the few sports where being a professional coach is way more difficult financially and time-wise than a college coach. Correct. And you just, there's just so many, only so many teams to work with where yep. you, you almost, you like have to take the internet. Like if there's a top tier, say Canadian team that's here yeah. and they want to coach, like it's hard to turn that down. <laughs> it is. I mean, in 18, I was working with Emily and, and Kelly and I was working with Melissa and Sarah, you know, and then they've, Emily and uh, Kelly got into the money Mm -hmm. And it was a U.S. policy was like, you can't take the coaching stipend to give it to someone it's still in place. Yeah. And I was like, well, maybe you should change the policy. Yeah. It's like you're basically going to take their coach away from them that got them from 73 to like 12 in the world. And in a hurry. Too. In a year. Yeah. Or less than a year or whatever. I'm like, <clears throat> and they're moving in an upward trajectory. Now you're going to derail that because it's a stupid policy mm -hmm. that they know. It's like, you can't, you guys can't make a living. We get it. Right. But somebody decided they wanted to put that there as policy and then all of a sudden it you know detracts and it affected evie too yeah yeah you know he was working with the canadian guys team and he was like drop them and it's like we're just trying to feed our families guys <laughs> right <laughs> you know i mean i don't think the, it's the different it's not indoor it's not like we're going and working with a setter from russia or whatever right you know privately and then we're working for the u.s national team right you know so yeah and it's, it's and it's weird because the beach is so different from indoor in that like, the beach team's don't they don't root for for each other not in the states they root know. against you i mean you almost have to root against because you're playing against them right so cut through and you're them. playing for a higher stipend and and whatever it's yeah it's really strange i remember when reed when reed made the transition to beach he was originally trying to create this culture similar to indoor where it's like usa guys lifting each other up and they yeah. played in his first country quota and he was like i get it <laughs> <laughs> now now i, I don't want to help you <laughs> yeah and I didn't, I, I couldn't empathize either because Try always talked about, he's like, yeah, I can't watch other Americans play because I, ha I have to root against them and I don't like, I don't like doing that. Yeah, they're so friends. Don't, I just right. don't watch. Yeah. yeah. And then I was like, what do you mean you like don't root for them? And then when I was traveling and I was playing in country quotas, I was like, I now get it as well. <laughs> now I can't watch any, like I couldn't no. watch Bill play because we were flipping back and forth for that 12th and 13th spot yeah. on the stipend. And I was like, I can't, I don't want to watch. It's diaper money, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's like 500 bucks a month now. It's, it's a lot of diapers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How old are your kids now? Uh, 13 and 8. Okay. Yeah, it goes by fast. It's what I'm told. Really fast. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, Austin is like three times the size he was, and he's two months now. Wow. He's, he's a fat fast. kid. 
<laughs> he'll lean out. Yeah. DNA. He'll lean out. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at to me and Dia. I'm like, I think that he'll he'll stretch out. But yeah. right now, his arms have like 16 little rolls on. Oh him. yeah, That's, <laughs> he's super new. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's all just like cartilage now. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. It's really funny. It's been funny to watch Delaney just go from loving playing. She's like, I don't miss it one bit. She just loves being mom. Yep. What was it, the transition like you for going from playing, coaching, and dad? Uh, well, I, I continued to do it, right. so it's not like it's it's really no different for me. I just yeah. haven't stopped. Um, but no, being a parent is it's amazing. Yeah, you, know, you can't ask for anything more. You see your kids grow up and just experience all the things. You get to relive life again. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it goes by fast, Travis. Yeah. <laughs> it's really Father's fast. Day's coming up too. Happy early Father's Happy Day. Happy Father's Day to you. Yeah, Thanks, your first, first one. one. Yeah. yeah. Anything special? What are you guys doing? We are uh, just going out, probably out in Palos Verdes, and just doing a little picnic. Nice. And commentating in the morning. Of course. And then, yeah. yeah. You're, You're like getting... me waking up at all crazy hours right now. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you wake up at the nutty hours to watch the teams play, or do you just wait for the replay? I stayed awake till 11 last night to watch them, and then I woke up at 5, I think it was this morning. Okay. Those are at least semi civil hours yeah, to do. Get much sleep though. semi <laughs> <laughs> single parenting no sleep is not easy <laughs> yeah but the like the maldives or the australias oh god yeah that's those the maldives the toughest that was the toughest commentating i've ever had to do because it was i did i think the semis were at like 12 and one mm -hmm. and then i did the gold medal matches which were at three and four Oof. or four and five and i was like do i sleep yeah do awake. i stay up just pounded coffee yeah and they just crash all day yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so at least father's day it'll be i think the metal matches are 5 30 6 30 7 30 8 30 so i'll be done by like 10 or 11 oh, in the morning 30. yeah oh nice. nice and then just got the rest of the day to cruise they're not going to give you the day off <laughs> no let's go volley world i love commentating no i have so much fun yeah. i'd i'd prefer to do it yeah like, i'd watch them anyway so you do well. better than most at it too so it's <laughs> thanks i can listen to <laughs> appreciate that some of them just like you just admitted you don't know anything about the sport and you're having fun learning why are you commentating <laughs> it's like what <laughs> i just i have so much fun just because it's a fun new skill to learn yeah it's now i get to take all the stuff that i've learned the podcast has been a tremendous help getting mm -hmm. to know the players as well as i do and having to do the research to write and podcast with them and also playing has been a huge help yeah and then now i get to take that and use like my education with the written word and try to now speak it you don't have as much time to think about the words to choose when you're commentating <laughs> no you gotta be prepared you have to be super prepared yeah big time because you can't you can't just you can't like edit what you say hmm. you have to this is it's your first draft your first draft has to has to be your best draft yeah you can tell who the good ones are too because i've done the research mm -hmm. you can tell the ones that aren't because they just repeat themselves <laughs> <laughs> you're like oh that's no new information i've heard that already <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's fun i think it's made me a better player honestly because it, you have to think through a match on the fly. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm playing, I'll literally wonder, if I were commentating my own match, like what would I be criticizing <laughs> myself for? I'm like, oh, I've served Hagen eight times in a row, and he sat it out eight times. And maybe we should give Logan a ball. Let's do that. <laughs> yeah, it gives you a macro view of it, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it, look, that's, we just joked about that today at practice. I'm like, oh, I saw this, I saw that. They're like, oh, it's real easy over there. Like it is easy over here because I don't have to like move. <laughs> like and I'm looking for different things. I don't care about the ball. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's good. And good perspective. It's for good you. that you can have you you and your players can kind of razz each other a little bit too. I think it's important to have be able to have that relationship. I mean, I learned one thing a long time ago when I was playing. I had my worst year ever, and came to the realization it's still a game. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have fun, you're not going to play well. Yeah, you know. So I try to keep it a fun environment in the context of being serious and, and learning but you gotta have fun yeah you know i mean we're not getting paid enough not to right <laughs> <laughs> and even if you were getting paid enough it's just i still don't think there's not there's hardly enough money in the world but if you're miserable doing it it's not worth to do yeah i mean nothing's that serious unless you're dying right. let's be honest i mean it's really not that stressful unless you're dying <laughs> yeah and so. we're we're not dying in terms no, of no. Beach. <laughs> having a good time get some sun finally in the afternoon finally man Six it's months been nice to see that i know <laughs> it's been wild I'm going to have to switch our practice times to later. I know. I actually, I really enjoy practicing in the afternoons because 
that's when you play most of your the in crucial matches intense yeah the matches that matter you're getting you're playing at three yep. when it's windy and it's sunny and things are getting kind of crazy mm-hmm. but everyone like the women especially love the 8 a.m's like when do you play at eight in the morning i mean from a structure to get things done yeah and then get your rest for the next day it makes sense but yeah i mean how familiar are you with the like the european structures not very so i don't know all of it but i've talked to enough coaches and they all just kind of change it a little bit mm-hmm. some of them do like a two one two and they break it into sessions they don't break it into like days so it's an a.m p.m okay a.m p.m a.m p.m interesting and they'll go like a.m p.m a.m off a.m p.m off so they'll take different okay. like modules like if you want to call it off yeah and the but they're not killing themselves so they'll go out like in one of them it's an afternoon we're just gonna go serve and pass yeah you know and that's it so it's, it's an interesting to see how they like structure that. it where i think the americans are different because you know some of them have jobs most of them do <laughs> right yeah. it's not all they do i mean if we could do that for our programs i think it would be fantastic like oh yeah hey, let's pay them all 50 grand and right. the coaches pay the coaches yeah and then we can just do full time yeah <laughs> but yeah it's it's interesting to see the different structures around the world and how they all make them work you know mm-hmm. yeah i love a good like afternoon kob yeah i think it's just one of, you well, just no get, jump with everybody yep <laughs> a no jump afternoon kob with mesco he's the king of that he is the king of no jump so is theo Theo loves a good game. Um, you've and become the game very we're familiar. doing it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Like once a week, I think they were doing it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it helps. It's good for, in the women's game, it's good for at least one point a match. Yeah. At least. Yeah. You know, and the Europeans are so good at it. Oh, because, well, every, like all the European teams I practice with when I do travel, it's like an hour of no jump things. Mm-hmm. And then you'll do like half an hour yep. of jumping like stuff. thinking stuff while you're. Yeah. Yeah. It's and good. It's, it's pretty a cool. ton of good touches. You're not beating yourself up. You can, you can do that six days a week if you oh, want. Yeah. You're getting footwork, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. It's, I like it. And it's fun. It's fun. Yep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Keeps the vibes light. Exactly. <laughs> Who, uh, what coaches did you work with in your plan? If you had it? I didn't. Okay. No. Um, Who it wasn't like a thing back then. Yeah. That's what I was actually wondering. Like did any, like did Karch? Did they have coaches? He had a guy, um, this guy Kevin, and he was a little strange dude down there. Yeah, um, but he would help, you know, run through drills and stuff like that. You know, I don't know. Again, it's Karch, so like, how much are you really going to help? Yeah, teach him anything about the game? Because <laughs> yeah. he pretty was you know so smart and so good. Um, so yeah, I mean, I worked with that guy a little bit, but it wasn't like I learned a ton. Yeah. And I learned more from watching the top players and getting on the court with them and listening to them. You know, that was the biggest piece. There just wasn't a lot of coaches out there. It wasn't a mm-hmm. thing because we weren't make, making any money and we right. couldn't pay them, you know, and nobody saw value in it. Casey Jennings made a really good statement one time. Um, I worked with him for a little bit. And he's like, players don't get it. He's like, you get a coach because it's an investment. If you're paying the coach and you get better and you make more money, it was worth the investment. Right. He's like, but people don't want to take the chance of doing that. Mm-hmm. Now, that's a really good point, actually. Yeah. You know, if the coach is good and they're going to help you get better. Right. right. Who would you say influenced you as a coach then? Like, who are some of the people? Beach coaches? Yeah. <laughs> there wasn't any, so I didn't have anybody. Yeah. Because, yeah. like you said, you have a, a really strong, like, you have a reputation, a good one, as a very technical coach, yeah. where if someone wants to learn how to do something technically better or more sound, Scott Davenport is the guy. Like, where did you learn just the, the technical stuff for beach? Because it's such a, I don't know, like a free-flowing it is. game. There's so many weird things that happen. Yep, there is. I think fundamentally the body moves a certain way. Mm-hmm. And it moves safe, safely in certain ways. So the more you can ingrain the biomechanics of how the body functions relating to the sport, then you can be more efficient and you can enhance your athleticism. Um, I think from an indoor standpoint, um, like Tom Black – who's now okay. at Georgia, he was at LMU, he was at UCSD. Yeah. Uh, we played against each other way back when he, you know, we were qualifying and stuff. And he's an insanely talented coach, you know, and I've had a relationship with him, so I learned a lot from him. Uh, when I was at Dominguez, he was at UCSD, and I would talk to him, and I would learn, like, gold medal squared and stuff like that mm-hmm. and all their techniques and how it was data-driven, science-driven, you know, and I'm like, we just got to apply that to the beach, right? I mean, right. why aren't we doing that? Yeah. You know, so I just took a lot of time studying – the data and said, how can we do some things similar and create systems and do these all other, all these other things. But I wish there was more 
beach coaches back then that like had that tweak on things or had that yeah. approach. You know, I think if we if we created a curriculum of, of education that taught that stuff that kind of merged the two, you know, it would be super valuable. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we just don't have that. <laughs> yeah. What uh, I've heard gold medal squared a lot. I don't know exactly what it is. It's a, a system of training uh, for indoor, and okay. they've been around for quite some time. I forget who initiated it. Is that Rob uh, Brown? McCowan, I think. Okay. Carl is one of the initiators way back in the day. And Tom's been involved for a long time. He spun off a beach version of it with uh, John Mayer. Okay. Um, but I, I haven't participated in like any of their educational stuff, so I don't know like what they're teaching. Um, but yeah, it's it's clean. It's about systems, data, you know, angles, movements, all mm -hmm. this stuff. Obviously, it's more controlled environment, so you can kind of control those things. But I like the philosophy. It's it's really you know well done. Yeah. What's the uh, what's the big goal for you, Scott? <laughs> Any NCAA programs want to coach? <laughs> I still love my teams. Yeah, and I want to you know help you get to Paris if we can do it. But um, I'd love to take over an NCAA job. not necessarily take over a program. I'd work as an assistant coach. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, the travel is killing me. Yeah. You know, it's just getting tiresome and with the kids getting to that point where they're doing a lot of stuff now and you're gone, you don't get to see it. It'd mm -hmm. be great to, you know, be somewhere where you can kind of call it home and yeah, not kill yourself traveling as much and get more out of it. Well, at the, at the rate that the game is growing at the college level, going fast. it's going to be openings. There already are. <laughs> and if you need a reference... I'll reference Scott Davenport. I appreciate it. <laughs> We've got a long list of references. I think, I think I'd be about the 50th reference on that list behind. I haven't worked with you yet, Travis. Olympians. You haven't come to 24th yet. I do need to come you to 24th. You drive by a lot. I like, I've got a little scooter going by. I do. One of my favorite parts about being sort of like a, a nomad where I don't have a coach is that every time I get pulled into a practice with a coach, yep. I get to kind of listen to what those coaches say. Yep. So in a way, I get coached by everyone, even if it's just like, like Evie will say, "Hey, I'm I'm working with the Taylors, but here's something I saw." Yeah. Or like, "Hey, I'm working with Evan and Troy, but here's what you can do." And I just get to kind of like pick and choose a little bit. Have you ever been that generous? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've ever. I thought normally I'm just talking shit about my players and yours. <laughs> so what I usually what it's funny like I'll set up I'll be sitting like near the coaches and they're talking to their players and they're like, "This is what you should do in the highlight." Oh, you're like, just listening. <laughs> just professional eavesdropper. Eavesdropping. It's <laughs> It's the best way to learn. It is. It's the best way. And I, I love like getting in to practices, even with like, it's so funny to see all the different coaching styles. Yeah. You go, you start on first street and you see Evie, he's coaching one thing, one system and a style yep. there. You get to the pier and Jose's working and uh, he's doing a totally different style. Then you get to 16th street and you see Mike Campbell working with Chase Budinger on something else. And it's so many different ways of putting the ball to the floor mm -hmm. that's what i love i just love seeing all the different approaches and seeing what works for me yep it's uh trial and error i love the creativity of beach yeah there's a lot of it <laughs> yeah and that's got to be is that a challenge for you as someone like analytically driven sort of i feel like you look at things more of a an objective way of doing things in such a creative sport Again, I think you can create inside of structure. Yeah. You know, and it's always, my big thing is if you just purely go off of, I guess you can use Tom Brady is a great example, right? Mm -hmm. He wasn't high draft. He wasn't the most athletic guy. He wasn't whatever, but he was very diligent about my footwork, this and that and everything else. And <clears throat> because of that, he became, you know, the, one of the greatest quarterbacks ever. You know, I just recently was talking to another coach and they're like, asked me some questions. And I was like, I referenced this video go watch Kobe talk about Michael. Yeah. And like, what did he learn from Michael? Like, Michael was great, but he didn't start like that. Right. He had all the talent and the ability, but like the guy put in a ton of work. He studied all of his opponents. Like he knew if you took a step to your right, you were going to do this. So he would, mm -hmm. he knew if, based on the way that the team was going down the court, retreating to play defense, that there was a gap over here. And if he set himself up there for the pass, that he could run this move on the guy and score. Like, that's like next level thinking, right? So that took his ability and his athleticism and enhanced it because he was so clean on his fundamentals, you know, and clean on all the technical aspects of it. So to me, I don't want to say you're doing a disservice to your athletes because they're going to get where they're going to get. But mm -hmm. if you can enhance what they have yeah, by hammering home all those other things, they're just going to be better. Yeah. You know, and then they can be creative and do what they're really talented at on top of that, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah. 
And is it is it tough when your teams play each other? I step out. Gosh, that's got to be. <laughs> it's a rule. I just I don't give game plans. We just step away and we we'll let you guys battle. Yeah. Whoever's going to play the best plays the best. What's the what's the postmortem look like when you cuz you got to talk to one team like Teresa and Sarah, great job. Yeah. The one and you're talking to Emily and Megan, you're like, "Ah, oh, sorry." Like <laughs> it's you, so usually tough. you go to the losing team and you have like a debrief and then it's not so long <laughs> with the winners. <laughs> But it's pretty simple because you're talking the same language. You're, yeah. you're all doing the same thing. So it's really, it boils down to they made more, you know, plays or they you guys made more errors. It really, it's all boils down to. In yeah. The end, you know, it's got to be like watching your kids play each other. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was funny because last year I think it was they those two teams played each other like five times all the time. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. We're just like, yeah, it'll work. You know, when you guys we won't play each other that much internationally. Yeah. It won't work out, and like we're playing each other all the time. But it was fun to watch for me and Chris because they elevated their games and mm -hmm. played such clean volleyball that I was like, you know what? If you'd played anybody else, whoever lost that match, you would have won. Yeah. You guys were playing such good volleyball. It was fun to see. So for me, it's fun to watch, you know. But yeah, there's always got to be a loser, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. How has it been getting this new generation of athletes coming in? who were trained by the NCAA, where now you're working with mm. a sponsor. Well, Teresa is still relatively new to the game, but was trained at USC. And then Megan Kraft is coming out. She's like a polished professional. At I mean, how old is she? Like 20? 20, yeah. She's <laughs> 21 this year. Big birthday. Big birthday. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the NCAA challenges are that they have so many athletes, they can't really do what we do. Yeah. You know, and there's so many details and things that we can work on on the daily that changes the level that they're at when they come out. Um, I think the competition, uh, getting into the the systems, you know, that they're they're being trained in to travel, learning to travel, learning to eat right, you know, work out properly, all that stuff. That's a massive benefit. Mm -hmm. You know, they're kind of told to do that so they don't have to be self motivated. That's the big switch I think for kids coming out of college is like, got to do this on your own. Like right. If you don't want to do it, that's too bad. You got to do it. Right. And you got to make yourself do it. So that's the big, I think, challenge for them is self-motivation. Not that they're not self-motivated, but like, you know, sometimes you don't want to. Right. You wake up and like, God, I'm fucking sore. I'm really hurt. I don't feel like doing it today. Right. Uh, I can't cancel. I got to go. Yeah. <laughs> but, and it, I feel like it makes it, in some ways it makes it easier because you are now paying your coach. USC is now paying your coach. Correct. So now if, if you, like that's out of your own pocket. Yeah. So you'd be shortchanging. You'd be literally taking money out of your own pocket. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you it's get a different a coach, kind of accountability. Right. Yes. Hundred yeah. percent. It's 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 a really funny transition because we talked about how like the coaching, it's more stable to coach at the college level than professional. But then <laughs> you get the best resources as a player at the college level, and then you go to the professional level, and you're like, Wait, I got I got to pay my coach. <laughs> yeah. Like what I happened? Pay my trainer. I gotta do this and that. Yeah, I don't have all these things given to me. It's try trips about that all the yeah. time. <laughs> but I mean, that's part of the initiation, if you want to call it that. But yeah, it's a good little rite of passage. I think it's important. I think we're seeing a lot less of that right now. Mm -hmm. You know, not that it's bad. I think it's good that the development programs in place it gives them a place to train, learn things. Um, but I also think it doesn't help them like know how to grind. Yeah. You know, and we all had to grovel. We had to scrap. We had to starve. You know, mm -hmm. how bad you really want it. Yeah. And you need to keep doing this every day because you want that dream. Well, go do it. You know, that's but when you get things provided for you, it's not as tough. Right. You know, so you don't, uh, you don't really value what, what you don't work for. Right. And Alzina has a really interesting theory that he thinks that Nick Lucena became as good <clears throat> as he did because USA for a long time sort of ignored Nick. And kind of kept putting other people above him. And he's like, that kind of created a dog. And Nick was like, I'm going to prove you wrong. He's it's, always had that chip anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, so. so he'll, he'll find a chip yeah, anywhere no. he needs right. one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any, any motivation, right? A good athlete will find motivation somewhere. Yeah. You can make it up if you need to. But yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know that experience. I was with Nick in 2011 through, God, I was 14 or something like that. And he was already in the program at that point. Man, so. you've worked with so many guys. I didn't know you worked with Nick. Nick and Matt. We had to run to London. And it I all it all me. ended in oh. Rome. 
Oh my gosh! The last dude. tournament of the year. Furby was telling tell us you the about story? that. Oh, yeah, it's painful. Man, painful for those guys. So it was. Gosh, what was it though? It was like, uh, was it Latvia? Latvia and then the third Jake and Rosie. They and were up 14 11 in the third. No. Oh. And we're listening to the music because it yeah. was playing Born in the USA and it was playing yeah. Euro Techno. And it was a lot of Euro Techno. <laughs> and we're like, hey, this is good. They lose yeah. this. We win. We have a really good chance. Yeah. And then it started Born in the USA. started just going and going. Oh my gosh. And Dave Dennis was in the stands and he was texting. He's like, dude, 14 12. 14, we're like, what? How do you give up uh, that many points? You lost 16, 14. What in the world? Yeah. Like, how bad could it be? So, yeah, it was a heartbreaker for those guys because they they battled. And I mean, Jake and Rosie just had a phenomenal year, too. Yeah. They ended yeah. as the uh, tour champs. Yep. Number one in the world. Yep. So, that's, I mean, that speaks to how high level the USA was at back then. I mean, because I think, I mean, Nick and Furby finished like number seven in the world or something something along those lines and missed yeah. out on the olympics <laughs> yeah top 10 even top eight's not gonna get it done yeah i think that might happen on the women's side this year too yeah yeah, yeah i mean right the women's thing jeez louise i mean Therese and sarah being number five in the olympic race and third in the country mm -hmm. it's bonkers it is <laughs> i hope i don't get to experience that again yeah i i hope <laughs> i hope that's for you. <laughs> yeah. it's it's a fun race to follow I'm sure it's, it's exciting for as the fans. someone who is not emotionally attached to yeah. any specific team. <laughs> I'm like, I mean, this is cool to watch as an American fan because you have what probably five teams in the top twenty right now and mm -hmm. three in the top five. It's it's deep. It is. It's, yep. it's fun. It's gonna be it's a good race. Up with. It is. Yep. And world tour or world champs qualifying ends after Hamburg. I believe Hamburg is the last one. Yeah. And it's a top twenty four on points. Top 24 on points, your best six finishes out of all your okay. finishes. Okay, I want to make sure I had that right. So I think it's it's pretty much solidified. The three the three spots are solidified, solidified yeah. on the women's side. Kind of a fight the fourth, fourth is pretty tough to for Julia to lose it, Julia and Betsy to lose it. But, you know, anything can happen. Yeah. And it just depends if, like, Megan number and Tony and Savvy are there. Um, but they've got to get into the tournaments with the points. Yeah. Like Betsy and them were fortunate they had the points to start in the mm -hmm. leads. So they got finishes out of the gate, you know, so that helped them. But yeah, it's always a tight race. It is always a tight it's race. It's fun to watch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I know you have two kids waiting at home. Don't want to take up too much of your time. That's summer school, man. They're in. Summer school. One's in summer school. The other one, he's a gamer. He sits at home. Nice. I have to worry about him. So it's today was break. a light day. That's a good break for dad. It was a good break. <laughs> <laughs> What's a typical day for you? Uh, get up, get the kids ready, get them off to school, go to work, spend countless hours at the beach. Yeah. Get home, quick shower, food, go pick them up. Dad stuff the rest of the night, whatever it is. If they got activities or they got yeah, get them ready for bed, do it all over again. Your kids into volley? Uh, my daughter's starting to do it now at eight. My son was into tennis and golf, and then COVID hit and it ruined life for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but he just didn't re-engage because you want to wear a mask, and go play, and. All that stuff. So he kind of got into gaming and socializing online. Gotcha. So he's just kind of into that now. But yeah, still yeah. into golf. Uh, he is a little bit top yeah. golf. <laughs> top golf. Hey, that's it's still golf. Yeah. Top golf is the new bowling. It's Angry Angry Birds golf. It's yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit of gaming, a little bit of golf. It's right. a new combo. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Are you yeah. are you a golf guy? Uh, pretty bad. I used to do when I had time. Yeah. I would play a lot. When I was playing. I played a ton. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love it. U.S. Open's going on. I was going to say, did you watch any of the Open yesterday? Uh, a little bit. I saw Rory say a double bogey, but he had that whiff shot Yeah. on the last hole. He swung under the ball and missed the ball completely. Never seen anybody do that. He hit a drive out. 340 yards and hit a shot zero yards. Yeah. <laughs> then made a killer putt to finish it off, right? I know. And that was insane. <laughs> That's golf right there. <laughs> those, those guys, they're impressive mentally. Yeah. Like, and Ricky Fowler ending up in the – like straw had to hit a shot over a bridge and still shoot 62. Wow. It's insane. Yeah, I don't know if you saw that, but you could have watched no, that. But I just watched the conditions. I got to play a course that was it was the next level below. There was a tournament. It was in Menifee, California. There was a tournament there that week, and I got to play it Okay. like two days after it. So the conditions were the same as like for the pro tournament. Yeah. Ridiculous. The rough, like this first cut, second oh. cut, it's like weeds. Yeah. Like how do you guys – Get out of that. And it's nuts. <laughs> like, you can see, like, guy yeah, like Brooks Kepka, like, he's muscled through yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But some of them, you look at, like, Matt Fitzpatrick. Yeah. He's, like, 5'8 
145 pounds. I'm like, how are you hitting that out of the rough? Yeah, break your wrist. I know. <laughs> it's nuts. It's crazy. But yeah, no, it's amazing they can do what they do in those conditions, like like a U.S. Open conditions or even Masters where it's lightning fast greens, no forgiveness. Yeah. Have you been to Augusta? I haven't. I want to go. I didn't know if... Have uh, well, have you been to Bethpage? Bethpage is yeah. not too far from you if you're yeah, upstate New York. It's a pretty brutal course too, I so. saw. Yeah. I want to do Bethpage because it's public. Is it really? Yeah. You can just drive Ooh. up and play. But you can't make a tee time. So, oh, so it's like Tory Pines. You just show up. You just show up. Sleep in so your car. Sleep in the car type uh, deal. gotcha. Yeah. Might be too old for that. <laughs> <laughs> you still got a little road dog in you. Jeez, I don't know. <laughs> we'll drive a camper there. We'll do... That'd be fun. Yeah, you do the podcast from there. We'll get some golfers. Oh, that'd be sick. Right? Me, Lilo, and Troy have golfer. talked about putting together an AVP Ryder Cup. That'd be cool. It'd be fun. Because there's a lot of, like, a lot of the guys are getting into golf now. Yep. And you could bring some of the older guys back. Exactly. Who are really good, like Jake and Rosie. Yeah. Rosie plays a lot of golf. Yeah. Jake plays a lot of golf. They have their Lockheed, little Ryder Cup. but he's not around anymore, but he was... He's back in New Zealand. He was yeah, a good... Oh, he was, like, scratched. a professional golfer. He was going for it. He yeah. He had it, too, yeah. That's it's a good athlete. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like one of the best players in New Zealand, beach history. He's like, ah, yeah, I'll play some golf. Yeah, <laughs> let's do golf too. Why not? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if he had done it, that would have been great because there's that's the real money. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Higher barrier to entry. A little bit, <laughs> <laughs> but still, all the mental stuff. I golfed with a PGA uh, Japan guy one time, and I was like, like, what's the difference? I mean, you're out there. I'm like, mm -hmm. are you that much better or that much worse than these guys? They're like, we're all scratch. Yeah, he's like, then what's the difference, really? He's like, you got a six foot putt to make, you know, it keeps you in the cut, or make you make the cuts to go play in the money, or you don't. Yep, you're standing over it, and there's like some people around you watching it, and like, can you make the putt? If you make the putt, those are the guys that are in there. Yeah, I'm like that's, that's how it should be in every sport, pretty much. I think golf is because I played pretty much every sport under the sun, yeah. and I think golf probably taught me the most lessons. One hundred percent. All you players, go play golf. Yeah. Even if it's just go to the driving range, do it. Yeah. Like managing your emotions, the mental mm -hmm. side of things, like playing playing the course backwards and like each shot for its own, staying in the present. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. I reference golf all the time when I'm coaching. And it's, most it's of them just, are like, the girls are like, good for life what are you too. talking about? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, go play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you'll get it. Just go play a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Because golf, I mean, you're out there on the course for four, four and a half hours, but you're playing golf for about a minute and 30 seconds. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Everything else is up here. And you're not playing anybody. Right. Like you're playing yourself and your swing and your abilities and yeah. your brain. Yeah, it's fun. And that's what Delaney, she does not golf. She loves mm -hmm. Top Golf. But we watched the US Open for about six hours yesterday. And <laughs> well, you watched it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, she she's so interested in it because of the mental side. Right. She's like, the ball doesn't move. Yeah. The defense doesn't move. Nope. There's no strategy against the players. And yet it's just mental warfare yep. the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> I was I got to go watch Tiger at a practice round at Riviera years ago. Okay, I don't know if you've gone and watched any rounds. Yeah, it's really cool to see how they approach it. Like mm -hmm. you don't see what they do. Like they hit like six balls, go drop six wherever they think is the worst, yep. the best. Hit five six different shots, and then you go watch them on TV. And you're like, oh dude, he hit a ball out of the bunker, 220 yards, wrapped it around this tree, landed it to save par. Yep. But all he was thinking about was, all right, I know if I keep my elbow in. I don't let it flare on this swing. I got a chance of getting on the green mm -hmm. <laughs> because he hit all those practice shots, like the exactly. preparation side of just the detail stuff like we talked about earlier, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's fun. It's a fun game. Yeah, I think I covered a couple U.S. Opens uh, when it was at Congressional. Yeah. Um, and I worked for the Washington Post. And w going out there and, like, getting inside access to just watching their mm. practice rounds, it's just next level, level like, of detail. Who was it? Bubba Watson? Have yeah. you watched him on the practice course? Mm-hmm. Were they betting? Oh, always. How crazy was it? I'm going to hit the shot and bounce it off that green over to this. I'm like, what are these guys doing? Mm -hmm. They're just shelling out hundreds. And an obscene <laughs> amount of money. Yeah, and those dudes will carry around so much money and cash. cash. <laughs> <laughs> just like, Phil, put it away. I right? Can't. It's embarrassing. <laughs> I'll, I'll carry your bag for like a thousand. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I'll loop for you. Right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great sport. Everybody should go play it if you're playing any other sport. Yeah, it's a good, like, Good life lesson, teacher. Yeah, it humbles you. It does. Like if you <laughs> can fast. manage yourself at that game, you can play any sport. Mm -hmm. Everything else is easy. Yeah. yeah. That's why I think compared to that, I, I've found that managing the mental side of beach is really easy. Yeah. I think that I've built, I think the mental side is one of my better strengths as a player because of golf. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
hundred percent agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Scott, is there anything else you want to chat about? Anything we might've missed? No, I think we covered a lot. We did. We didn't get too deep into the, the bad things. So we're good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was overdue for a couple of years. Yeah, for sure. And so in six years, we'll have you on again. Well, maybe in 18 months, we'll come back here and we'll be going to Paris. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. We'll make a deal. So. When one of your teams win, one of your teams qualifies for Paris. That'd be great. On. It's going to be a fight. It's going to be fun. <laughs> well, is there anywhere that people can follow you specifically? Oh, I have an Instagram, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> 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 I don't post really. I'm too yeah. old for social media, but so, follow my teams and maybe they'll tag me in something. Yeah. So can... follow uh, Troy and Evan and Sponsel and Therese and Stockman and Megan Craft. Yeah. And Chris Flood. Find... Chris Flood, too. And Chris Flood. Him. He posts a lot. It's his generation. Yeah. It's good to know that he uh, is looking for kind of his own team because there's a lot of teams who just don't. There's not enough coaches, no. good ones anyway. Right. And Chris is, I think he's ready for that promotion. Yeah. Of, he needs it. He wants it. Yeah. You know, he's getting to that point. He's in his, he's 30 now. Oh my God. <laughs> he's getting over the hill. It's time to branch out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome, man. Good to have you on finally. Thanks for having good me. Good luck Appreciate to your teams it. this weekend and the rest of the year. Thanks, dude. And you safe well. travels. <laughs> we'll need safe sleeping travels. <laughs> safe sleeping travels. <laughs> exactly. Shoots. <laughs>